Um, I just wanted to ask you, Sean and Leon spoke about the process of architecture and the way it starts with a pencil and sketching for Sean. Do you do the same thing? We still do that, yes, definitely. It's, it's the first part of, 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 I suppose, distilling our ideas and getting our thoughts together and having the argument and debate because mm -hmm. um, we're a more... W w it's more of a matter of... Sorry. Of rather than... As Sean's very much singular designer, we're, we're more... There's more collaboration in what we do. Yeah, so can you tell, talk to us now about the Venice Pavilion and how that started and the process of that competition and working through that? And you sure. already built an under budget, I heard. <laughs> well, I think it's going to be built <laughs> within budget or close to and it, it'll be finished in about uh, five weeks. Can't um, wait. It was, a, it was an interesting process. It was a competition, and, and Sean was part of that competition, and I know deeply disappointed not to, not to win it, <laughs> and uh, has berated us about that ever since, but <laughs> in a nice way, yeah. Um, but it, it, um, so it was a competition. It was a competition that we won, and then it became a, a game of getting it made. But I think it's the, idea, the ideas about the building that were of most interest to us as to what, what on earth a, an Australian pavilion in, in Venice was all about. And, and I have to say it's singularly different to this pavilion. This pavilion has a, has a, has a transitory nature to it. It's, it's light and airy and it, it opens up. It, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's more a folly. Whereas the pavilion in Venice is, 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 is very much grounded and has a, a permanence about it and has to sort of um, stand, stand against all these other range of um, pavilions that have been built by a whole lot of other countries over 50, 60 years, um, some of which are awful and some of which are quite interesting. Um, but it has to sort of stand there. And, and I think we had to think very hard about what, what that meant. And so what did it mean to you? Well. I think we sort of ca we came up with a whole lot of words, and I suppose some of the key ones were things like um, enigmatic, uh, reserved, sort of sitting back and, and looking. Um, I have this sort of little anecdote that, that I give that w when we did the um, Museum of Sydney in, in Sydney, we commissioned a fantastic um, piece of sculpture by Fiona Foley and Janet Lawrence, which was called The Edge of Trees. Um, that sat in the forecourt of the, of the Museum of Sydney. And the, the story behind The Edge of Trees, which was a, a piece that was written, I think, i do not sure when, but about when the first Europeans landed um, in Australia, the traditional owners of the land were standing there in the edge, looking at them from the edge of the trees. And I suppose we took that, we, we kind of took that idea and thought about something that the, the site, the site sort of sits, so we can put, we actually push the building back into the, into the trees, and kind of felt that we, quite like the building to be something that was coming from, from Australia back to Europe, and and sitting in the edge of the trees, somewhat enigmatically, and and sort of looking out and letting people sort of wonder what the hell it was. And there's been some discussion around the materials that you use. Do you want to talk about them? Yes. Well, I start, the original idea started off that we. We wanted to do this. Well, the, the 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 brief talked about a white box. It was very clear. There's a number of different ways of approaching museum design, um, and a lot of architects um, today, recent museums, make museum museum spaces that are fairly mannered, um, and this was clearly a commission from the opposite point, where they wanted a very simple, clear, clean space that could be w treated by the artist totally as their own. So we started off with this idea of a white box. So then we thought, well, what about a black box, a white box inside a black box? And that really became the idea for the for the for the project. So we decided uh, in the competition idea that we'd make it out of black granite that came from Australia. This uh, beautiful granite in South Australia called South Australian Imperial Black Granite, and that was the idea. The reality is that we couldn't get we couldn't get it. Um, by our understanding, the, gra the granite quarries are now owned by Chinese and their main interest is in cutting up into th um, 300 by 300 granite tiles and exporting it to Asia. And we weren't able to convince them to supply large blocks of granite that could be sent to Italy and sawn up. Um, again, we'd 
done a number of buildings in Australia, um, 101 Collins Street is one of them, where the, the stone was sent to Italy, just not far from Venice, cut up and sent to Australia. We like the idea of sending the stone from Australia, having it cut up and then installed in Venice. It didn't happen. Um, I think that we've got black granite, but in, I think in fact it's from Zimbabwe. Um, but in the white, the stone? white, the, the, the white isn't stone. The white is the inside. Of the, okay. Is the second box inside, which is which is basically um, traditional uh, exhibition space of, of plywood with plasterboard on it, mm -hmm. so that you can hang, do what you want, and repair afterwards. And how much ex exhibition space is there? There's about th 350 square meters of space. So. Uh, and how does that compare to the Philip Cox? Um, in terms of usable space for the artist, it's, it's about, um, I guess it's about 30 or 40 percent larger, um, but it's also a single space and it's also got five metre ceilings and it's also, it has a whole lot of things that Philip's temporary pavilion yeah. just didn't have because um, it was low ceiling that was broken up, it was fragmented space um, and this is full gallery quality space in terms of air conditioning, in terms of lighting and data and all those sort of things that you need. Mm. Well, Philips was actually a temporary pavilion yeah. which he gave himself very generously. That's was right. never supposed to stay there 20 years, was it? No, no, that was the, that was the theory. And uh, interestingly, um, when we initially started, the heritage people in Venice said, yes, you can pull it down, it's not heritage listed. So we started the process and then uh, Heritage Regionale stepped in and said, we put a blanket heritage listing over the whole of the gardens, you can't pull it down. So um, what did you do? So uh, we had to negotiate a political outcome which was we changed the specification from demolish the building to dismantle the building and put it up somewhere else. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it's coming back to Australia. It's, that's certainly the hope. Yeah. 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 So it's, uh, it sounds fantastic. I yeah. can't wait to see it in May. Mm. But I have to, uh, I, sitting here I realised that we'd actually done another temporary pavilion in Melbourne. Really? Tell in us about that. <laughs> in, uh, in 1970, believe it or not, as a, as a student stroke graduate, we, uh, we won a competition to design a temporary pavilion for the Australian Institute of Architects convention in Sunbury. Um, <laughs> and it was sponsored by Alcoa and was actually built and after the, after the uh, con convention pulled down, taken away. Leon, did you see that? No, no, no. no. <laughs> <laughs> I arrived here long after that. But John, did, did that pavilion do the thing that we suspect pavilions do? Did it, did it allow you to test some idea about what an architecture might be and then leap forward from there? I uh, well, I think it did. It allowed us to sort of work with ideas about what you could do from what Alcoa could supply off the shelf and convert into a, a, a space that was um, usable or, or sort of could be used for whatever purpose it was put up for, which was to exhibit, exhibit some things for the convention. But it's interesting that so much of your work has an industrial design approach it within it, which maybe that was the germ it was of a, it. It was pretty close <laughs> to being the germ of it, I think, <laughs> yeah. It was an yeah. interesting idea because it was just bolt together and okay. patch together and um, get it up quickly and uh, then unbolt it and pull it down. So yeah. it was very much in that same, same sort of idea. And when did you start your architecture firm? Uh, 1972. And was that just straight there, out of university or Pretty who did you go yes. and work with first? No, it was straight out of university, yeah. And why did you decide to go out on your own rather than go and join a large firm? Um, well, when I say straight out of university, we did work for someone for six months and then an opportunity arose and we just took it, grabbed it. Fantastic. Yeah, yeah so it's... And that, in a way, that that first project, if it's the one that I think it is, has some of the characteristics of a pavilion. I mean, you, you, you tested a whole lot of ideas. It's been demolished, it's disappeared, but it forms part of the intellectual history of the mm. practice. I doubt there's a photograph of it anywhere. Oh, yeah. what a shame. <laughs> it may be one, but uh, uh. it's been and gone. Well, there were yeah. three pavilions here, as you know. John Truscott did three in the late 80s and early 90s. Uh, Chinese <coughs> tea room, which I don't recall. Do you recall no. that at all? No, I don't. Do you? Well, no. And no. then there were two Botanicas, one Botanica one and Botanica two, done in 1990 and 1991. I remember those, but I couldn't tell you what they looked like. 
Uh, yeah, they looked like um, sort of Harry the Hire tent, actually. <laughs> um, they were supposed to be sort of like a mini version of the Chelsea Flower Show. And um, Paul Bangay has come back here, as you know, to do all of those um, garden beds mm. for us. So it was great to have him back again. He was just a student out of Horticultural College at the time. But um, they created an enormous impression. Mm, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the pavilion is, is, is a, a fascinating sort of thread through, through architectural history and time. Um, and uh, it's always interesting to sort of revisit and, and debate it. And I think this, this is just such a lovely example of it. I think it was a, it was a, a brilliant first commission. Thank you. So and do you find it um, harder to build a temporary? I know Sean talked about this quite a bit, that it was really hard to um, build something that's actually temporary. I suppose versus something which is obviously going to be permanent. Yeah, I'm not. It's not something I've thought about. In principle, no, I don't. I'm not sure that it would be such an issue f for for me. Um, I th but it's certainly a different, quite a different sort of proposition. Um, you, you, I think as architects, you don't particularly like the idea of building something and then having it just taken away. So you would you, you would hope it has more longevity, and and uh, you can only hope that the you know the Melbourne City Council does do the right thing by the. Oh yes, they're the already. They've mm. got some great plans. Although yeah. there there is there is a the long history of making pavilions, national pavilions for the international expositions in yeah. different countries, and yes, and yeah. the politics associated with those are really intense, aren't they? I mean, you get um, yeah. the 1922 USSR pavilion by Melnikov, which is just an extraordinary statement, yeah. replaced at the next exposition by a wedding cake. <laughs> yes, I think, uh, I think the, yeah. the, 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 the proposition behind the International Expos is very, mm. very fragile, and it's only occasionally when a country is enlightened that it actually get, you actually get a good building, and you get countries like um, America, USA, which has long just said, no, all we want is, a, all we want is to hire some space and, and get um, suppliers to come and rent the space and and show off what they make, and so they sort of take they they take the expo at its sort of most degraded sort of form and not not as yeah. the opportunity for architecture. So when the op when when good pieces of architecture actually come through that process, it's it's uh, pretty lucky. So something like Thomas Heatherwick's Hedgehog at in Beijing, absolutely lucky, <laughs> <laughs> lucky. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, quite quite amazing that it actually occurred. Yeah. And yeah. wasn't the Eiffel Tower supposed to be an impermanent? Oh yes, it's a, yes, yes, it's a temporary it's structure. <laughs> lasted quite a while. <laughs> it yes. was it was as tall as Sean's cone. <laughs> anyway. <Yeah>. Sixty meters. <laughs> yes, and mm. I think it suffered an awful lot of uh, pretty heavy-handed criticism as well. Mm. Oh, it did too. Yeah. And wasn't our exhibition building a temporary? The, the the original Melbourne exhibition building was temporary. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I think no, so. a World Heritage Site. Yeah. Um, yeah. Remembering that the, the second World Ex Exposition in 1888, eight years later, covered the whole of the, the, from the existing Royal Exhibition Building right through to Carlton, right through to the back street. Mm. 